Let's pray. We'll dive in. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for the privilege that is ours to worship you. Father, may you speak to us through your word. May your spirit be at work in a very powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we continue the Frame series, and if you remember from years past or from last week, we take uh, the 28 fundamental beliefs, almost said 27, uh, we, we take the 28 fundamental beliefs, we can't cover all of them, but we take a number that Pastor Jeff and I sit down and kind of go through and say, yeah, let's hit this one, let's hit this one, and we talk about them, and we, we, we refer to them as frames, essentially. It's sort of the way that the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has framed up or has sort of captured from Scripture what we believe about particular subjects that the Bible addresses, and we sort of put them in a, uh, in a frame, uh, if you will. Um, to talk about them and to help people to understand what we believe and what we teach. Last week, we talked about death and resurrection, right? We talked about how death is asleep, and we uh, talked about how Jesus is the resurrection. He will come back, and he's done everything he can, including defeating death, so that he can ultimately be with us again, right? And so that's a powerful, powerful truth that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches. And so today, we're going to look at um, what I really love the way Pastor Jeff, if you're not listening to one and two or one and three, make sure you listen to those as well because Pastor Jeff kind of brings, comes from a different angle with it and he's got great stuff that he's sharing at one and three. But I like the way he put this particular doctrine or teaching, fundamental belief of the Seventh day Adventist Church, he kind of called it a landscape as, a, as opposed to a portrait. Um, it's kind of broad and and all-encompassing in many ways, it covers a lot of territory. And so I have very limited time, and we have very little time, but I'm going to try and get through it as much as I can, and and hopefully you'll walk away with a fairly good understanding of this. uh, It's it's fundamental belief number 11. Uh, It was actually the last one added. So it it made the 28th, but it's it's numbered in the order uh, in our fundamental beliefs as they're listed as number 11. So a little bit of confu- little confusion there, but that's just the way it is. All right, so that's where we're going. We're talking about these frames, particularly this morning, growing in Christ. And remember, our goal ultimately, if we do our job, if I do what God has called me to do, you will see Christ emerge in the, in the picture, frame, in the picture, right? You'll see Jesus come forth because Jesus should be in all of our teachings and in all of our doctrines. So that's the, that's the goal this morning. All right, so all of us had probably our favorite TV shows as we were growing up. For me, I loved to watch all the superhero shows. Those were my favorite. Um, but there's also one that was kind of interesting that I loved and enjoyed watching. That was The Little Rascals. Loved watching Little Rascals. Loved watching the adventures of these kids. Now, if you're young, you probably have no clue what I'm talking about, although I think there's a modern version made of the Little Rascals. But the Little Rascals was basically this uh, group of neighborhood kids from kind of all walks of life. And um, these kids would sort of hang out and get into all kinds of adventures uh, in their neighborhood. And they would come up with all kinds of plans and ideas and adventures and fun stuff. Sometimes those adventures and those plans would get them into pretty difficult predicaments that would potentially get them in trouble or put them up against their, 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 their bully enemies, and, and they got themselves into all kinds of stuff. I loved watching uh, Buckweed and Alfalfa and Spanky. You remember the names, you guys? Yeah, I loved watching those guys. It was so awesome. Now, the thing is, you and I didn't get to see a show done where those kids grow up. We didn't get, they didn't make a show like that. They probably could, and it would be interesting. But you don't get to see a show like that. So, but, but what is understood and what is believed is that eventually you probably grow and you mature to a point where you are no longer considered, considered a little rascal, right? <laughs> In fact, you, you should not be doing, you know, you should not be doing some of the things that, that you did when you were a child, Right? In, in some of the little games you played and the mischief you got into and, and those sorts of things, the assumption is at some point you grow up and you are no longer this, this little rascal and, and we can use the excuse, well, they're little and they're young and so it's, it's, it's okay and, you know, you sort of get disciplined and you move on. That's kind of the, what we expect to have happen. 
Well, here's the thing. That isn't always the case, particularly as we come to spiritual life. That's why the Bible actually has to talk about why we need to, why we should, why it's expected of, expected of us to grow up in, in Christ. Because God doesn't have in mind that you should remain the little rascal that you were born. <laughs> And the truth of the matter is, you may be offended by that, but you were born a little rascal. And to a certain extent, some of us continue to live as grown, big, grown-up people as little, big rascals. Because we find ourselves in predicaments that we never planned to get involved in. We find ourselves on adventures that we never probably shouldn't be, should be involved in and exploits that we probably should never be involved in that, that find us in all kinds of messes and trouble. So listen to what scripture, how scripture kind of puts this. So the Bible in Psalm 51.5 says this. Um, Psalmist says this, for I was born a sinner. Just put in rascal there. It's a little bit easier to take, right? <laughs> I was born a sinner. I was born a rascal. I was, I was shaped in my mother's womb. From the moment my mother conceived me, I was a sinner. So we kind of come by this honestly. But notice, the Bible continues. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So not only are we born sinners, but it has done something significant to us on a spiritual level um, that, that, if not addressed, will make us remain little rascals that get into predicaments and foolishness that we should not get into. And so he, he, Paul addresses it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. So not only are we born with it, it has caused a death within us. That's the death of our spiritual spirituality, our spiritual life. And he continues on. He says, You were, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, you were a rascal, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ultimate rascal, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So Paul just describes the predicament that we all come to this life in. He describes how we come to the table spiritually, disconnected from God, spiritually sort of going on our own path. Actually, he says spiritually dead. So here's the thing. Here's what I picked up on in life. Now, I'm not a scientist, and there may be some weird anomaly in science where dead things actually grow. But last time I checked, dead things don't grow. So spiritually, if we are dead, we're not going to grow. So Jesus had to come and to resolve that issue. But I want to show you a picture here. And I love my wife. She is an amazing woman. And she has relented to let me show uh, some pictures on the screen of some plants that always seem to die at, at our house. <laughs> And she's a wonderful mom. She nurtures the children just fine. The children have not died, people. They are, they're doing fine. But the basil plants in our house, <laughs> the basil plants in our house don't always make it, all right? They don't, always, they don't always thrive in the Anderson home. That's kind of what they look like, all right? So they're not growing. They're going to waste away. They're going to get thrown out. They are no good to anyone. And so Jesus, God understood in his, in his wisdom that we come to the table sort of dead spiritually and he had to do something to deal with the deadness. And so check this out. Go down to Ephesians. We're still in the book of Ephesians. We're going to move on to verse 4. Dead things don't grow, right? But living things can grow. And so Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. He says, but because, this is awesome, but... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, rascals get mercy, sinners get mercy, amen to that, who is rich in mercy, made us alive 
with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Yes. It is by grace you have been saved, verse 6. And God, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus um, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For it is by grace, again, he emphasizes it, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God, understanding our deadness and our rascaliness, recognized that and sends Jesus out of his mercy and his love for you and me to awaken us, to bring us back so that we can experience spiritual life and spiritual growth and spiritual meaning so we can make sense out of this life. Verse 6 is kind of interesting. I'm going to land here for just a moment. Don't have a lot of time. But verse 6, he says this. And God raised, verse 6 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. And, and he says this. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He's saying, he's expressing an idea in scripture and in the theological world that says that you and I, when Christ came back from the dead were also brought back with Christ. We were in Christ as he was doing all, everything that he needed to do to save you and me. So the cool thing about that is we are associated with Jesus and all that he's done. We were in him. We were a part of his team. And all that he was doing, you and I couldn't be there. You and I haven't been seated with him in the heavenly realms, right? But in Christ, you and I have been brought back to life and are seated with him in the heavenly realms. So the Father sees you and me in all the goodness that Jesus has done and the life that he brings. Let me illustrate it this way. So um, I was in Dallas a couple of weeks ago, and I had to go to the newest headquarter facilities for the Dallas Cowboys. Amen, amen. All right. Favorite team, and so it's their headquarters. It's in Frisco, Texas. And there's, I took the tour. It was like a two-hour-long tour, and I was like the dude at the back of the line slowing everything down because I just had to take it all in, all right? So here's, here, they take you, and towards the end of the tour, you come to this big, this big section, and they had the five, five championship trophies. <laughs> <laughs> five of them. All right. And then they, have, then they have the five Super Bowl rings of the, of the Cowboys. You could just walk right up to them. They're encased in the glass. And you, just, you can look at all the diamonds. They're probably just fakes. But, you know, they look like the real deal. And so uh, I'm sitting there looking at them. It's really, really, really cool. And then the guy, the guy talks about, he's talking about the rings. He talks about how everybody in the organization gets one. Everybody, and not just the players. The players go out on the field and they hit people and they have to get beat up and score touchdowns. But everybody in the organization, because they are associated with the Cowboys organization, gets a ring. Gets a ring. See, you were associated as a human being. You're associated with Jesus, the one who went to the cross, died, resurrected at the power of God. And, and, and came back to life and is seated at the right hand of God. You are in him because you are associated with him. Guess what? You get a ring, baby. <laughs> you get a ring. Amen. But he didn't finish there. This guy was telling me about the rings. This blew me away. He says, um, he goes, he says, you know what? They actually have some upstairs that people part, who were part of the organization never claimed. Never claimed. <laughs> Wait a second. You, is there like a sale? Can I get one of those discount? You know, I'll take one. I haven't done anything. Unclaimed rings. Unclaimed. Can you imagine, man? You, Dallas Cowboys, most most amazing franchise in all the sports. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> But, I mean, imagine unclaimed. And so here's, here's, here's where it kind of lands with us very personally. 
There are people who won't claim the ring. It's there. And it's by mercy and by grace that it's offered to us, and it's, it's a free gift, and, and it's, it's right there. And you can, you can claim that gift and claim the life that it brings and live in that life. And, it, and you're, you're, you're accounted as, as good in heaven and you're seated at the right hand. And you are, you are set to go to live the life that you were intended to live in Jesus. But you got to claim the ring. You got to claim the ring. And so there's this good work that God has done on our behalf. He's, he saves us. He's, he's, he's won the battle. He's won. He, he's, he's, he's taken care of everything. You and I were in a deficit and dying to sin, and Jesus comes along and he overcomes sin. That's what Jesus does for us. But there, uh, when it comes to this doctrine, we're really talking about what Jesus wants to do in us, to grow us, to help us to become. But do, do you recognize the implications of this? It's, it's that, that Jesus has already accomplished something for you. It is, it is there is power over darkness. It's victory over the darkness. So you get to claim that same victory and power over darkness and sin and death and all of that. You, you are in a good place. So you don't have to worry so much about being saved as much as you have to concern, your with, concern yourself with what do I do and how do I live as a saved person? And how do I grow in this grace? And how do I grow in all the things that God would have me to grow in? Because God has taken care of the biggest thing. He slapped a ring on my finger. I'm good. Interesting passage that Jesus Jesus, uh, shares with us in Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Just at the tail end of this is the parable um, that we're all familiar with. He says this, um, verse 14. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear... But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So it may be that the barriers to our growth are the very things that that, that Jesus mentions here. He says, life's worries, riches, and pleasures. I'm going to put them to you this way. It's It's our trials, our trophies. Our trials and our trophies. Those two things can be the biggest barriers to our growth. It can kind of choke the spiritual life out of us. Our trials and our trophies. And whereas trials often do good for us, they help us to grow and to become, sometimes they can also wipe us out. And our trophies... We have things that we've acquired and attained in this life that we are proud of, and we got, we got this, and we got that, and, and we've been afflicted with affluence. <laughs> and it's nice. And we may, we may settle into that reality and not think about how we need to grow spiritually because materially, everything we got is, we're doing all right. That's why for us as Americans, when we travel abroad, we go to other countries, uh, maybe as a missionary or, or a mission trip, a short-term mission trip, and we hang out with other Christians in other parts of the world who don't have as much, they haven't been afflicted with affluence like you and I, we marvel at their happiness and their sense of spirituality. It's true, right? You do. Because with all the stuff that you and I get to enjoy, enjoy, and it's a blessing, don't get me wrong, I'm not dogging it, want to live in this country, definitely blessed here. But with all the stuff, it can become the worries and the riches and the pleasures that sometimes make us forget about my, my responsibility to pay attention to growing. Sometimes I can become content as the little rascal, the little immature dude that gets to have all the excuses because I'm a little and immature. But at some point, you as a Christ follower have to step up to the plate, own, take responsibility for your spiritual life, not, that's not, for your, not for all that Jesus did and what only Jesus could do, but for right now, as you live in this reality with your, with your trophies and your trials, you have to say, I got to grow in this. Whatever trial I face, I'm going to see it as, as God's attempt to grow me and to make me into something that, 
that he wants me to be. And whatever trophy that I have on my mantle, whatever accomplishment I've, I've managed to have, whatever success I've managed to attain to in this life, I'm not going to let it put me into a place where I just sort of sit by and rest on my successes without understanding, first and foremost, how God wants me to grow. Because some of our blessings, man, can be a big curse if we're not careful. So, a couple more passages and we'll wrap it up. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. Listen to what Paul says here. Colossians chapter 2 and verse uh, 7. Actually, I'm going to take 6 and then 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, that's what we're talking about. Jesus, you received Christ Jesus as Lord. That's where you take the ring. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Continue to live your lives in him. Rooted and built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. The way we don't get tripped up by our trials and our trophies is remaining thankful. One of the most powerful evidences of spiritual maturation is growth, and is when you can be thankful when you got a whole bunch of stuff, and when you have a whole lot of trophies, and when you don't have a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of successes. Are you still thankful? Do you still show up at church and, and sing praises to, your na- to his name and raise your hands? Y'all don't do a whole lot of that here, but when you raise your hands and shout to Jesus, And say amen. I'm taunting you a little bit. That's right. Even in the trials and even in the the difficulties, even when you have a lot, when you don't have a lot, are you thankful? Paul says over in the book of James, he he says, count it all joy when you experience trials of many kinds. Can you be joyful in affliction, joyful in the trials and all that kind of stuff, and then walk away and still talk about being thankful? That's, a, that's big evidence. Let me go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. God has not left us alone to work out this growing in him all by ourselves, but we are his handiwork. He's working with us. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God, God prepared in advance for us to do. So probably another one of the most significant evidences of spiritual maturation and growth in Jesus is when we recognize not only being thankful, uh, that we need to be thankful, but we also recognize our responsibility, dare I say it, obligation to serve those around us. So it's not enough for you to get your ring and then ignore the rest of the world. We get our ring We express our thankfulness and our gratefulness, and then we step up, roll up our sleeves, and serve humanity, and give to humanity. Jesus came, and he said that he came to serve and not to be served, and that was Jesus, people. Thankfulness and serving. We are God's handiwork. He's there with us. And I'll begin to close with this. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this. Remember this, man. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So you are a work in progress. We are a work in progress. We are going from being little immature rascals that get ourselves into predicaments that we really should not be in to becoming these Becoming these servants, these sacrificial, sacrificing servants of Jesus, reflecting his image and his character, growing in Christ, thankful for the ring that we received so that we can have the privilege to come alive and be able to live this life and to grow spiritually in Jesus. Confident. Be confident, man. Even in your low moments where you're thinking, man, I'm not growing. I'm right back where I started. Paul says, be confident. He started a good work in you. He ain't going to leave you alone. He's there. He's working. And he's working to create a masterpiece. 
And when it goes in the frame, guess what? You don't show up. It's a beautiful thing. But Jesus does. So you get to be this little masterpiece walking around, and, and, and people are, are, are drawn to it and, and, and taken aback by it. But it's not you, and it's not anything that you've done. It's this Jesus who you've associated yourself with. All right, so Arkansas is my hometown, grown, born, born and raised there. There's a spot um, in northwest Arkansas called Bentonville, Arkansas. It's the home of Walmart. Walmart's a great place. Um, but it's something else that's there now. And um, you probably didn't realize this, but you can go to northwest Arkansas where everybody just would kind of think, man, this is a little podunk Arkansas backwoods. Bentonville, Arkansas. But do you know that you can go to Bentonville, Arkansas, and you can see world-class art? World-class art. It's called the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Alice Walton. Yeah, that Alice Walton. One of the founders of, of Walmart. Lots of money. Let's just put it that way. It was her idea to bring this American art, this treasury, really, of art. I think it's, what are they saying? It's, um, it's 50,000 square feet of gallery space to little old northwest Arkansas. Um, there's an article that I came across that, that said, uh, Mayberry meets Manhattan. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. But you know, that's kind of odd to find art incredibly valuable art in a 50,000 square foot gallery in northwest Arkansas right next to the Walmart. So here's the thing. The God of the universe has masterpieces in all kinds of places. He's got them right here. He's got them right here in little old Forest Lake Church. He's got them down the street at other churches. He's got them walking the streets. He's got, he's got masterpieces in all sorts of places. And here's the thing. He isn't done creating masterpieces. He continues to create more and more masterpieces. And they come out and he places them in all kinds of different places and settings. And he's growing you. And he's forming you. And he's shaping you. Be confident of that reality. That God is at work in you. And he will make you into the masterpiece that he wants you to be. And it can be right here in Forest Lake or it can be somewhere else. God places masterpieces in all kinds of places. Let it be you. Let it be you.